You're tuned in to the only all sports talk network in the Middle East, IsraelSportsRadio.com. Check out the Israel Sports Radio store by clicking on the store tab on IsraelSportsRadio.com. Great items such as t shirts, hats, books, and much, much more. Price does include shipping, and we do ship throughout the entire world. All major credit cards are accepted to make your shopping experience easy and convenient. So once again, click on the store tab on www.israelsportsradio.com. Connecticut School of Broadcasting founder Dick Robinson. You know, the media business has changed a lot since we opened our doors in 1964. Now media content is everywhere, on air, online, on the go. More than ever, companies are looking for people to help drive this new media. At Connecticut School of Broadcasting, you'll get hands-on training on the latest software and equipment in a matter of months, not years. Connecticut School of Broadcasting has placed thousands of grads in broadcast media careers. It's all about versatility. You see, at a radio station, if you also know how to shoot, edit, and post videos, you become a pretty hot commodity. That's the training you get at Connecticut School of Broadcasting. Connecticut School of Broadcasting with locations up and down the East Coast from Massachusetts to Miami. Call 1-800-TV-RADIO or log on to GoCSB.com. Connecticut School of Broadcasting, the nation's oldest and largest group of broadcast media schools. Redefining training in radio, TV, and new media. Get trained. Get connected. 1-800-TV-RADIO. Live from Studio C at the Cherry Hill Campus for the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. Down goes Frazier. He scores! High fly ball into right field. She is gone! Welcome to another edition of Radio Powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. Simulcast it as the Yusty G Show on IsraelSportsRadio.com. As always, 856-330-4749 if you want to jump in on the conversation. Or you can send me a message on Facebook. Search for Sports Talk with us at the Yossi G. That's T-H-E-Y-O-S-S-I-G. We got a lot to talk about. Not a lot of time, not a lot of time to do it. First things off, have you been living under a rock? Because if you have, then you probably have not heard about this whole Richard Sherman, what he said about Deshaun Jackson causing a lot of, uh, uh, I want to say, go so far as to call it uproar, but certainly getting a lot of talk about what he wrote on MMQB, Monday Morning Quarterback, the Peter King website, uh, in describing the whole situation, the whole, uh, all the details, all the drama surrounding Deshaun Jackson and the Philadelphia Eagles, of course, to rehash for a moment, the Eagles felt that they couldn't go forward with Deshaun Jackson, so instead of really, really, really pushing every single button so far as the fans could see and the media as well. They decided to release their Pro Bowl wide receiver, like pretty much their number one wide receiver on the team. They decided to release him, and not only does he go and sign with another team for a little bit less money than he would have been making with the Eagles, not only does he stay in the NFC, but he goes to the NFC East, stays in the NFC East, goes to one of the Eagles' most bitter rivals, the Washington Redskins, signs with them for three years, $24 million, $16 million guaranteed. It's really, if you're an Eagles fan, this is really one of those things where you just throw your hands up and just go, what the heck were they thinking? Can't you all just get along? Because at the end of the day, that's what it seemed. It seemed that Chip Kelly, the head coach, going into his second year, he feels, or at least so it seems, so it comes out, the vibes coming out from Eagles camp, Chip Kelly feels that he and his system is good enough that he can plug in any type of wide receiver, any type of player, and they can play for the exact ability that Chip Kelly expects to procure from that specific player. Be that Deshaun Jackson or somebody else in the draft or Riley Cooper or Jeremy Macklin. Everybody has their exact way of going about things. Everybody has the specific place they're supposed to be. Everybody has their assignments that they must do. And Chip Kelly believes that his system is so good 
that he can replicate, duplicate, or even make better than what he was last season with the Eagles, this season going forward without Deshaun Jackson, because he can replace Deshaun Jackson with somebody else. Deshaun Jackson, of course, he was mostly mum about it, you know, the whole situation in Philly uh, during the last two, three weeks when reports first surfaced that the Eagles were trying to trade him. And then if they couldn't trade him, they would release him. Calling, He called that time, uh, he, call, he called the day that he was released from the Eagles a humbling experience. I mean, think about it. You go from the Pro Bowl, over 1,000 yards recept- receiving, more than 80 catches, nine touchdowns, to being released, to not having a job. I would call that a pretty humbling experience if you asked me. And uh, we're going to have on in just a moment Kyle Eckel, former, former Eagle, and also a Super Bowl winner with the New Orleans Saints a couple years ago to talk about this. But when you look at the whole situation and you look at how it kind of happened, you can really almost say, you know, it's old regime, new regime. You had the Andy Reid holdovers, those who fit into Chip Kelly's mold and fit into his system. He's kept. Those who have not, he's disregarded. He's thrown to the wayside. Simply, he's released. And when you look at it from that perspective, you almost you can understand it's the Eagles, or in this case, Chip Kelly, didn't feel that Deshaun Jackson provided enough of a reason to, to remain on the team. They didn't feel that, yes, he's talented. They're not going to deny that. But he's a very enigmatic receiver. He's a borderline diva. There is question about his character on the field, question about his character off the field. And, of course, there's always that big question of money. What about his contract? Did they want to pay him? Did they believe that his $11 million that he was due to be earned this coming season, that that was good enough? And apparently, they didn't feel that that was good enough because they go ahead then and they release him. And to get more on this, I bring on right now former Eagle and Super Bowl winner with the New Orleans Saints, Kyle Eckel. Kyle, how you doing, man? Hey, good. How you doing, buddy? Thank God. Very good here. Welcome to the program. Sports Talk with the Sports Rabbi here on All Noise Radio, powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. Simulcast it as the Yussie G Show on Israel Sports Radio. Kyle, you played on the Eagles. You know kind of a little bit how the or- that organization specifically is run, but in general how football organizations are run. And when you look at this whole Deshaun Jackson saga and how it really began and over the last couple of weeks how it eventually ended with Deshaun signing in Washington – when you take a look at the Eagles organization, do you think they were in the wrong to do to go about this the way that they went about it? Well, it's a it's a question with a lot of different you know answers. I think, but it, it, for a long time, or well, not for a long time, but for about a week now, I'm thinking there's got to be more to the story, and I, I'm I'm not necess- I'm not necessarily convinced that this is all the information there is. Perhaps it's all the information that's going to be released and going to be known to the public. But if this is it, then I'm really disappointed in the Eagles not being able to squash this. I mean, this looks like a failure of leadership more than it is Deshaun Jackson being a problem child. I mean, yeah, he's got issues, but, you know, he's a great player and a great threat. And with a player like that, you have to reel him in. you got to do your best. One year under Chip Kelly, and he can't, and then he gives up on, uh, on Deshaun in that fashion. If, if this is all the information that we know, I just, I'm, uh, I'm disappointed because losing Deshaun Jackson is going to hurt this offense in a lot of ways and perhaps even hurt the, hurt the Eagles' picks during the draft. Now they might have to go wide receiver earlier than they wanted to. Well, when you look at the Eagles and, and how they may have handled it, I don't think that there really is a way that they could have gone about handling it in terms of specifics. You know, the fans, well, they want specific questions to be answered. They want to hear specific, well, I don't know if they want to hear specific answers, but they want certain specific things to be addressed. The problem for the Eagles is that they probably are not able to address those because of legalities, implications, things like that. And one of the things that came out in the report on NJ.com was, about Deshaun Jackson's supposed gang ties. Now, you were in a locker room. There's 53 guys coming from 53 different backgrounds, have 53 different opinions and 53 different personalities. I'm sure you had something to do, some some uh, experience with talking to some of your teammates who didn't necessarily come from the best of neighborhoods. 
do you have any idea what exactly gang ties, and I use that term very loosely, what exactly that means? Well, I think what the paper was was meaning and what that phrase actually means is Deshaun Jackson has friends who are in a gang. I think uh, I think that's pretty much proven. I mean, he's in pictures with people. He's uh, he has a member of his record label who is in a gang. I think that's just what that means. And to and I don't excuse Deshaun Jackson for, for for having friends because he grew up in a rough neighborhood. I think that that that's a lot of baloney. There's a lot of there's a lot of players in the NFL who grew up in bad neighborhoods and separated themselves from it. And you know, I grew up in South Philadelphia. Now it, I didn't grow up in a bad neighborhood, but you know, I knew some bad people, and I used to hang out on the block. And you know what I did when I signed with the Eagles? I didn't run back to 18th Street and hang out on the corner. I didn't meet up with those bad people. I met up with the good people. And there are good people. I'm sure Deshaun Jackson grew up with good people. But he grew up with bad people, and he seems to uh, not have separated himself from those people. So I think gang ties is, uh, you know, he has friends. He knows people who are in a gang. And, you know, if he's going to flash gang signs on the field, you know, that's more, that's more evidence of him being affiliated with people affiliated with a gang. So, you know, it's a, yeah, it's a tricky situation, but I think that's what it means. When you have somebody like Deshaun Jackson who goes ahead and, and, and posts Instagram photos of him flipping the, the Crip sign and does certain things that people would relate to, quote-unquote, gang ties or gang-related uh, incidents, gang-related images, things as such, how much do you think the Eagles were a little disturbed by that as a possibility of, of especially when you look at what happened with the New England Patriots and Aaron Hernandez and, and what he's on trial or waiting trial for allegedly right. doing, how much do you feel that the Aaron Hernandez New England Patriots situation came into, into play here with the Eagles and, Des and Deshaun Jackson? I think it was certain. Yeah, I think it was certainly in the minds of the Eagles organization, but, and you know, they probably didn't want to wait until something like that could pop up. So perhaps they got rid of him for that purpose, but I think it was just Chip Kelly did not want to deal with this type of, with this type of type of kid. And it's confusing to me because Chip Kelly coached at Oregon. Okay. He got a lot of PAC 12 recruits. A lot of those kids come from California and don't tell me they all come from great neighborhoods. So, you know, I mean, Deshaun Jackson went to Cal, for heaven's sake. That's one of the best schools in the country. So it's not like these kids uh, only go to poor colleges or poor places around the country. You know, he went to he went to Cal, and Chip Kelly recruited a lot of the same players that, you know, came from Deshaun's area, Deshaun's school. So Chip Kelly has a, has a relationship with people who are probably of similar, you know, ties, as Deshaun Jackson does. But Chip Kelly couldn't reel them in. He couldn't bring them in. And if you're going to flash – if you're going to flash gang signs on TV or you're going to flash them on, on Instagram or things like that, you find the crap out of Deshaun Jackson. You find the crap out of him, and he won't do it again, I promise you. Well, we know one of the things first, and of course we have here with me Kyle Eckel on the program, former Eagle and, uh, of course, a Saints Super Bowl winner a couple years ago talking about Deshaun Jackson. When you look at what Deshaun Jackson means or at least meant to the organization up until, up until all these reports started surfacing, and you look at what he's brought to this city. Yes, he's a mixed bag of goods, but there is a lot of positive things that he brings to the organization, a lot of a positive dynamic. Do you feel that perhaps the team sold itself a little short by not going that extra mile, perhaps, to extend Deshaun an olive branch to say, okay, one more season, and that's it, man. These are going to be the restrictions. Like you said, no more gang signs, no more things, you know, that we find a little bit disturbing. We'll pay you your $11 million. Or do you think that, no, at the end of the day, it was all about the money? I think the team sold itself short if this is all the information that is available or that's even existing. I think the team sold itself short huge. Deshaun Jackson does so much on the field that people don't see. I mean, he keeps safeties back. And, and what that does, I mean, he keeps them way back. I mean, there's deep threats. He keeps these guys way back. That opens up with passing windows underneath. We see Chip Kelly loves these crossing routes. The reason why these crossing routes, are, the windows were so huge and Nick Foles had room to throw the ball was because there were safeties weren't in the picture. Now, now you're going to have safeties come way up and it's not only going to influence the windows that the wide receivers are trying to run into, it's going to influence our running game. There's going to be an extra defender in the box. 
It's going to influence what kind of calls defenses are going to make. They're going to blitz more because they have an extra man. They don't have to worry about a deep threat anymore. I'm sure Jeremy Macklin's a nice receiver, but he's never had 1,000 yards in a season. He's coming off a torn ACL. He's not exactly your go-to guy in the first week of the season. He's a big question mark. So I think the team really sold itself short. And like you said, I mean, you find the guy. There are there are rules in there are rules that exist today when a kid or a player or a 27 year old man like Deshaun Jackson is, I believe, if he steps out of line, you punish him for it. You don't have to cut him. I think this doesn't really come down to the money. I think this just comes down to Chip Kelly just frankly not liking Deshaun Jackson and not liking the attitude he had around the locker room. Forget the gang ties. Forget the forget the money. It was the attitude around the locker room, and he wanted to get rid of it because Chip Kelly thinks he can bring in somebody else. He can draft a young wide receiver in any round, and he's going to fill the shoes of Deshaun Jackson. And I think he's going to be sadly mistaken. This is not college football. This is the NFL. We have on with me Kyle Eckel, former Eagle, talking about the Deshaun Jackson saga. You mentioned, of course, the locker room conundrum and of course we also remember the last season when he blew up at the wide receivers coach because he was complaining about being open and not being having the throw the ball thrown to him how do you think that the Washington Redskins now that they signed him how does that affect their dynamic going forward with the wide receiver core that they have and the team dynamic as a whole well I think on paper it's a great addition but but I don't think it's going to influence their offense uh, well, you know, I, th- I don't think it's going to influence as much as people think it will. Um, Sean Jackson is the type of wide receiver who needs to catch the ball on the run. Catch it and keep his stride and run. And that's why Nick Foles came in and looked so great. I mean, I like Nick Foles, and he makes those passes. But Nick Foles had the weapons around him to where he can make those throws, those 10-yard crossing routes where a player catches the ball in full stride and just continues on his way. RG3 can't do that. He proved last year he can't hit the side of a barn. Okay, so this is a guy who needs, who has a lot of work to do still, throwing the ball in the pocket. He's going to be in a new system. And then you have Deshaun Jackson coming in, who is the type of receiver who needs to catch the ball on the run. And there's, it's no mystery why he had his career season last year. He first, in his, first time in his career, Deshaun Jackson had a quarterback who can hit him in stride. And Deshaun Jackson took off with 1,300 yards, nine touchdowns, 80-plus catches. So I could see a lot of regression in Deshaun Jackson's numbers next year. And then I also see Eagles fans saying, well, look at Deshaun Jackson. He's not having a great year. But that's not, that's not what's going to tell the story. What's going to tell the story with Deshaun Jackson's production is his quarterback. And, frankly, the Redskins are a mess to begin with on defense. So they, they have a long way to go to be a winning franchise. Well, that's true, and it'll be interesting to see because the Redskins have had the high-risk players before and had, have had mixed results. D'Angelo Hall, yeah, of course, and becoming a team leader. I don't leader. think his attitude is going to be too big of a deal. You know, the Eagles went 10-6 and six last year, and everybody thought they were going to be the inverse of that. So, you know, Deshaun Jackson, obviously his attitude didn't hurt the team enough to where they lost games, and I don't think it'll hurt – the Washington Redskins either. And like you said, you know, they, they, they have had a history with players who've been questionable at times. So so maybe they do a good job reeling these guys in. And, you know, I hope the best for Deshaun. I just think, you know, his, his fit here in Philadelphia was, was, was perfect. Well, perfect no longer. The story comes to a close here in Philadelphia for Deshaun Jackson. He's off to Washington and hopes that he'll have more of a career with them like the Angelo Hall and not so much as Albert Hainsworth, the other uh, uh, high-risk player that they took and had a, a really one headache after another with him. Yeah. Uh, Kyle Echol, former Eagle, Super Bowl winner with the Saints, thank you so much for hopping on Sports hey, Talk with the Sports thanks Rabbi. Thanks for having me, bud. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it, man. I know where he's. Take care. That was Kyle Echol. Former Eagle and Super Bowl Saint, Super Bowl winner with the Saints, joining me on Sports Talk with the Sports Rabbi, simulcasted as the SCG Show. When I come back, a little bit more football talk. Your chimes, your tweets, your text messages, and maybe even some of your phone calls. You're listening to Sports Powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting, simulcasted as the SCG Show with IsraelSportsRadio.com. It's been 48 years Connecticut School of Broadcasting has helped place thousands of people, just like you, in exciting careers in radio, television, and the new media. At Connecticut School of Broadcasting, our hands-on approach is different. It's designed to have you spend less time in the classroom and more time in the studios. From the first day, you'll work with state-of-the-art equipment. Learn by doing from our team of industry professionals who come from their studios to ours. 
The best part about it? You'll learn it all in a matter of months, not years. Connecticut School of Broadcasting has a network of 12 campuses from Massachusetts to Miami. Remember, it's never too late to love what you do. So do what I did. Call 1-800-TV-RADIO. Step into the fast-paced world of the broadcast media. Day and evening classes begin soon. Connecticut School of Broadcasting. Get trained and get connected now. Call 1-800-TV-RADIO or log on to GoCSB.com. Your computer is blowing up. blowing up to the sounds of all noise radio. Powered radio. by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. Welcome to Radio, powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting, simulcasted as the Yussi G Show on IsraelSportsRadio.com. As always, 856-330-4749 to hop in on the conversation or send me a message on Twitter at the Yussi G, T-H-E-Y-O-S-S-I-G, or a message on Facebook, Facebook.com, and search for Sports Talk. We had on Kyle Eckel just a moment ago uh, before the break, former Eagle and also former Saints, won a Super Bowl with the Saints. Talking a little bit about this whole Deshaun Jackson conundrum and what exactly, uh, you know, what exactly went went down with Deshaun Jackson and the Eagles, and we brought up some points. You know, of course, when you look at what he did on the field versus what he did off the field, there was a lot of questions that, of course, come up in terms of money. In terms of, do the Eagles believe that eleven million dollars for this guy is worthwhile? Especially when you consider he's late to team meetings, he misses team meetings, he doesn't display professional on-field behavior. So you lump him into this category of problem behavior. Now you throw in some of the questionable characters, some of his friends that he keeps off the field. The best thing he could have done for himself, for his own brand, the brand of Deshaun Jackson, especially when he's keeping questionable company, was to have a behavior where nobody will say boo to him. Look at somebody like Richard Sherman, also grew up in a tough neighborhood, still has friends from his childhood, as he explained on MMQB, Monday morning quarterback Peter King's website. Nobody says anything to Richard Sherman about that. Why? Because he displays a certain professionalism on the field. Deshaun Jackson, not so much. There's also people who are talking about the old regime, the new regime, Andy Reid, Chip Kelly. Chip very much felt threatened by Jackson's behavior in terms of Deshaun not being one of Chip's guys, uh, not fitting in with Chip's program, so to speak. So Chip felt that he had to get rid of Deshaun Jackson in order to ensure better locker room stability for the way that he wants to run a locker room, for the way he wants to run his team. At the end of the day, this is politics. It's as simple as that. Chip Kelly played the political game perfectly. Deshaun Jackson left a lot to be desired. Because of that, Deshaun Jackson finds himself in Washington in an unfamiliar system. He has to learn a whole new offensive playbook on a team that went 3-13 and last year. Now, when you talk about this whole concept of helping out friends, right? You have people who would ask their friend who became a professional ball player, became an actor, an actress, for a little bit of help, a little bit of financial support for a little bit of time. That comes up, and it even doesn't have to be a professional. It doesn't have to be a, a, an actor, actress. It could be a regular person. People have asked me, they say, hey, sports rabbi, or hey, Yossi G., you know, let me a hundred bucks. Let me a couple dollars. Now, if I have the money, I'll lend it to them, provided that they have a way of helping themselves. What do I mean by that is that they will say, okay, let's say it's you know it's a hundred dollars. Uh, I I can't pay you back you know tomorrow, but uh, I can give you ten bucks over the next ten days, and there's a hundred dollars back. I'm fine with that because. I know that you have a payment plan ready. You have a plan of how you're going to get yourself out of this hole that you find yourself right now in. I know that you're looking after yourself in the future. I know that you want to make a better life for yourself, so you're going to do everything in your possible that you can 
everything possible that you can do in order to ensure that you are coming or you will be removed from the current rut or the current status that you find yourself in. With that said, people who I find who they just say, hey, can you lend me $100? Yeah, it's a, it's a borrow it for keeps. Well, screw yourself. Go find, go, pardon my French, but go screw yourself. Go find $100 somewhere else. I'm going to go get a job, find 100 bucks yourself. Oh, but I don't have it. That's not my problem. Hey, could I borrow $100, uh, Sports Rabbi, and I'll pay it back to you over the next, you know, month? Yeah, sure, no problem. Let's, let's figure this out. Because I know that the first guy, he's not looking after himself. He just wants to be a leech. I have a problem with people who are leeches. I'll give you that first step, but then you got to take it from there. You got to be able to look after yourself. You can't look after yourself. Why should I look after you? You're not my wife. You're not my kids. Why should I look after you if you can't even help yourself? It's not my problem. Not my responsibility. That's what it is with players in today's professional sports scene, in the NFL specifically. They get, obviously not everybody got 53 guys on a team. Not everybody has come from the perfect home. Not everybody has come from even a nuclear family. You got a lot of players haven't been raised by one parent, haven't been raised by the grandparents, some of them. And not a lot of them were raised in really, you know, nice gated communities. So when you look at you have 53 different personalities, 53 different people, obviously you're going to have 53 different types of individuals who are coming to collectively together as a unit to try to win a Super Bowl. With that said, you got some of these some of these players have questionable characters as friends. But at a certain point, a player has got to realize that by keeping some of these friends around, they are going to be limiting themselves from making the most that they can while they can. Because you have teams like the Eagles who will look at a player like Deshaun Jackson and say, not for us, man. Go to Washington. Get paid somewhere else. We're not giving you that money. Not for us. And because you go to a different market, you may end up curbing your earning potential. You may end up curbing your endorsement deals because you're not in a very large market. So those endorsement deals go to, let's say, the quarterback versus the wide receiver. When you cut out some questionable characters because they can't help themselves, because they're constantly being a leech onto you, that's where you help yourself. That's where you now have a positive benefit for everybody else around you. When you look at a lot of this, uh, a lot of the people we're talking about, gang ties, a lot of, uh, you know, questions and a lot of cloudy air surrounding the gang ties affiliation with Deshaun Jackson. So during the commercial break, I decided I'll go on to the National Gang Center. I, I Googled it, by the way. And I'll just, you know, do some, you know, looking around, see what I come up with. Well, guess what? The first FAQ on the National Gang Center website is, what is a gang? You know, I, I was talking with Kyle Echo before when uh, he, we, we just had him on, exactly asked him that same question. Well, here's what the National Gang Center has to say. And I, I just take their, their, their answer by their word. I mean, at the end of the day, they are called the National Gang Center, right? All right, so... This is like this. The first sentence to explain and, and explaining what exactly is a gang is there is no single generally accepted definition of a gang. A recent survey of eighth graders I found in another uh, part of the website in nearly a dozen cities known for gang problems across the country found that nearly one in five, that's 20 percent, had been involved in a gang at some point of their lives. I mean, it's eighth graders, 12 or 13 year olds, 14 year olds. Been involved in the gang at some point, 20% of them. Now, take those 20%. Take those who have been involved in a gang. Expand that to gang ties. And, of course, the number is going to dr increase dramatically because you've got everybody in that class. They know that guy. They have a tie to that guy because they know that person in their classroom who is involved in a gang, who was involved in a gang. So, of course, the numbers are going to increase dramatically. Now, when you consider that the best athletes in a town, they're often popular, and they're often known by everybody, what are the chances of gang ties to those athletes? I would say they're pretty significant. 
Another thing the National Gang Center lists about uh, characteristics of a gang, they say that it, it means three or more members, they share an identity, they're typically linked to a name and often other symbols, the group has a, some sort of permanence, and it's a, some sort of a degree of organization, and it's involved in an elevated level of crime, criminal activity. So aside from the last thing, to me, that sounds like a football team. Got three or more members, they share an identity, they're linked to a name, often by symbols, they have a degree of permanence and of organization. Sounds like a football team to me. Also, when you kind of throw this all in to lump it all in together, it's also like the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. Because somebody in a neighborhood with a lot of people, and there's gang violence, you look hard enough, you're going to find a connection to a connection who is connected to a gang. Yes, you're the company that you keep, but with gang ties, remember, it doesn't necessarily lead to hard and fast gang membership. In the case of a six degrees sort of thing, it's only acquaintanceship. So are, you, are we going to go ahead and just write a player off because of he's acquainted with people who have connections to a game? I, I, I don't necessarily think that that should be the case. You have to look at the rest of the player. And when you look at the rest of the player, such as somebody like Deshaun Jackson, there is a lot of warning signs, a lot of red flags. We are the Eagles organization, the hierarchy, possibly thought to themselves, you know, we know what happened between the Patriots and Aaron Hernandez, what Aaron Hernandez is accused of allegedly doing. We are a little scared of that. It may be the same thing with Deshaun Jackson. Maybe we're scared that he was that when his house was robbed of uh, $250,000 cash and a bunch of guns when Deshaun was out of town, maybe that's a little bit of an insurance thing. Who knows? We don't know. It's possible. But when you consider a lot of his on-field and off-field behavioral issues, missing practice, yelling at coaches, insubordination, it's a possibility. And if that's a possibility, when you consider what Aaron Hernandez is accused of, who knows what else he could have done. Teams fear that they have possible criminals in their organization and don't want to have to deal with the potential outcome and outcry from harboring such an individual, from allowing such a person to play on their team. Now, does this loose characterization mean that all players who grew up in a questionable inner-city neighborhood, they should all now be worried about their contract status quo and be, uh, possible gang affiliation? That's a scary question that the NFL players are asking themselves now. Because there are a lot of guys, a lot of players in the NFL who turned to football when they were younger in order to escape the gangs, in order to get away from the violence, the drugs, the crime. Their gang is their team that they play for. It has its own colors, its own identity, uniform, symbols. And it's a, it was a constructive way, it still is a constructive way to funnel aggression and anger into something that helps themselves and the greater community. Obviously, the ideal situation is a, a player cuts all ties with his past when he reaches the NFL. And he chooses only the best influence and sticks with the, that best influence and sticks with them. But, as everybody knows, sometimes those questionable characters, sometimes those ties are often family members. And in some cases, a gang will look out for the safety of those that they favor, like a popular athlete. So it's kind of like a give and take over there. you got family members who are part of a gang. They're the family, and they really look out for me, make sure I don't get into too much trouble, make sure I'm protected. So, of course, nobody w wants a gang member on their team, but because gang is so hard to define, and gang ties is therefore even harder and more difficult to figure out exactly. If you eliminate all the players with gang ties from professional sports, you're probably going to be eliminating some of the most popular athletes in the world, with many of them having done nothing wrong, other than grow up in the wrong neighborhood. And that's a problem. When you consider somebody like Deshaun Jackson, who has a lot of that history of questionable effort, questionable character himself, insubordination, that leads you to believe that there's possibly something else there, or in that in and of itself is enough to warrant, I don't want you on my team. But if that player is somebody like a Richard Sherman, who has a pretty, at least thus far, has a pretty stellar off-the-field and on-the-field record, minus a 
Aaron Andrews outburst, and then you go ahead and say, no, we don't want you, that I'm going to have a problem with because that is unfair. That is something I cannot let slide. We're broadcasting simulcast as the SCG show on IsraelSportsRadio.com. When I come back, some final thoughts on the Deshaun Jackson saga and also opening week in baseball. Who's coming out of the AL East and who is the AL least. You're listening to Sports Talk with the Sports Rabbi here on All Noise Radio, powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. I'm Yossi Goldstein with your All Noise Radio Sports Update. It's currently scoreless between the Yankees and Houston as the Bombers are looking to avoid an opening series sweep to the Astros. Houston took the first two games in the series by outscoring the Yankees 9-3 at home as both CC Sabathia and Hiroki Karuda failed to get the Yankees into the wins column. The Mets were swept earlier this afternoon by the Nationals 8-2 as Zach Wheeler gave up three runs on seven hits and six innings to the Nats in D.C. All local area basketball teams are in action tomorrow night as the Knicks will try to continue its recent hot streak for the final seed in the Eastern Conference when it hosts the Wizards. The Nets entertain the Pistons hoping to build momentum for its playoff push and the 76ers are back on the road against the Celtics hoping to avoid back-to-back 30-point wipeouts. This all-noise radio sports update has been brought to you by Chabad Packer, where all your travel questions are answered. That's C-H-A-B-A-D, Packer like the backpack. Visit them on Facebook or at ChabadPacker.com. Honey, again you're sitting here sulking? I hate my job, and I don't know what to do to change it. Get off the couch and go check out the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. The Connecticut School of Broadcasting? What's that? The Connecticut School of Broadcasting offers a career and lifestyle change through a broadcasting experience you won't ever forget. Log on to GoCSB.com to find out how a career in broadcasting is for you and not just the people you see on TV or hear on the radio. CSB focuses on many aspects of real-world broadcasting and their knowledgeable instructors teach you through a hands-on approach so you're in the studio in no time. To find out how CSB can help you work in an industry you love, call 1-800-TV-RADIO or check us out online at Go CSB.com. Why work 50 weeks a year for a two-week vacation when you can enjoy your job every day? Don't just sit there. Call 1-800-TV-RADIO or log on to GoCSB.com. Thanks, Thanks CSB. CSB. All Noise Radio. The noise. The noise. You can't ignore. Powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. You want to hop in, 856-330-4749. You can send me a tweet at the Yossi G, T-H-E-Y-O-S-S-I-G, or send me a message on Facebook, facebook.com, and search for Sports Talk. Uh, you know, when you have, uh, you know, like contracts, right? Uh, you have contracts for a player on a team. It often becomes a smear campaign by that team. So the team can walk away a monetary win, uh, monetary winner. Brian Dawkins, remember Brian Dawkins, B-Doc? He had contractual talks with the Eagles years ago. It's one example. Remember how he played through pain, fought through injury, so he could play on a weekly basis? What happened when it went to the negotiating table to talk about a new deal? The Eagles balked, claiming he was injury prone. Regarding Deshaun Jackson, it wasn't about the gang stuff, I don't think. It was about not acting in a professional manner and not correcting that about himself. When a new new coach comes in, he's not as invested in the old regime as he is in his regime. Something isn't to his liking. He won't tolerate it for too long. He gave Deshaun, Chip Kelly gave Deshaun Jackson one season to become a chip player. And Deshaun threw in the chips and said, I fold. Time is going to tell if this is going to come back to bite Chip Kelly and the Eagles. Chip said he wants guys who can get open in man coverage because he wants to spread open the opposition, spread the field. He won 10 games in 2013. He believed so much in his system that he allowed Deshaun Jackson to walk. If d cleansed his act and cleaned it up in Washington, the Eagles may regret the move. The whole gang connection thing, again, I can't stress this enough. When you, when you sever your connections with people who you grew up with at some point, does Deshaun Jackson say, associate, associate myself with specific people that's going to hurt my earning potential? It's being a professional, doing what you're supposed to do without cutting corners. When, you're on the, when, when you have guys 
who leech off of you, they're probably going to affect you in some way, some fashion. And that's what I think happened with Deshaun Jackson is that his people who carries around with him, who he keeps close, started affecting his personality, started affecting how he acts on the field like he's entitled to everything. Now, when you have something like this, it, it, it's just, it's really, it, the whole thing is just shocking. Because, yeah, nobody wants a type of player, but now are you going to go ahead and start saying maybe this puts everybody else on notice? I don't think it's going to put everybody else on notice. I really don't. I mean, look at, look at what happened. He, it's not like he's without a job. Washington picked him up. Now, yeah, does it affect Washington going forward with this new dynamic on the team? Of course. Deshaun signed three years, 16 guaranteed, 24 million overall. The Redskins have a really, a really good receiving core. They have Deshaun Jackson, Pierre Garçon, Andre Roberts, Jordan Reed, and Alfred Morris. It's pretty, pretty solid if you ask me. Uh, the team is going to be pretty good to watch, I think. With uh, all the receivers, the tight ends, and also with Robert Griffin the third running around, he's not injured. He's not coming off an injury. Not rushed back from an injury. He's got a whole off season to rest and rehab and all that. I think the locker room culture is undergoing another change, and that might be a greater challenge in Washington with the Redskins, because the locker room culture right now, you know, you you have the it's it's a little fragmented, but I think it's it's okay. You have D'Angelo Hall, you have RG three. It's a new ch a new coach in. Everybody's got a clean slate. Jay Gruden in. Mike Shanahan out. The wide re the wide receiver that's coming to the Washington Redskins. He's also don't forget Deshaun Jackson can also punt return. He's got speed. He could single handedly change the pace of a game. And also, they're also getting a player who's not afraid to speak his mind, or be what some per perceive to be as selfish. That's going to be the question with Deshaun Jackson following him all the way to Washington until he dispels those rumors, until he gets rid of that perception that people have about him. Remember, this is a guy who's coming from an Eagles team where he was late to team meetings, he's deactivated for a game for that, he dropped a lot of passes in 2011 when he wanted a new contract. He held out in training camp for that for that contract. He argued with coaches on the sideline about not being not having the ball thrown to him when he was open. The Redskins have the high risk player. They've had these players before. They've had mis mixed results. They had D'Angelo Hall, like I said, he became a team leader and a better player on the Redskins. Albert Hainsworth, on the other hand, caused one headache after the other. So when you really pull it all together and you have this type of a guy, it's, it's really almost like a, like a wonderment, firstly, of how he goes from one team to stay within the division, a, a bitter rival, signs with another team 150 miles away from him. I mean, he's 150 miles away from, from Philadelphia. How, how he goes from being a 1,300-plus yard, nine-touchdown, 80-plus reception, Pro Bowl-wide receiver to being put out on the street, so to speak. I mean, no one's feeling bad for him. You know, he's, he kind of did this, did this all to himself. But it does make you wonder about how fleeting life in the NFL is. The only money that you have is the money that is guaranteed to you. The only time that you have on your contract is so long as you can actually bring something of significance, of value, to the team that you're playing for. Even coming off a Pro Bowl year, it shows, goes to show, that what the Eagles did really, to a, to a, to a large degree, puts everybody on notice. Not just for what they do on the field, but also for their company that they keep off the field kind of makes you wonder a little bit. Maybe Big Brother is watching just a little too much. But yet, on the other hand, they don't want this to turn into potentially something like what, what happened with Aaron Hernandez or allegedly happened with Aaron Hernandez, somebody who showed signs of, of violence, somebody who showed signs of gang affiliation when he was younger, had a traumatic event that happened to him in his teenage years. 
seemingly put it all to rest, and then, well, we know what he's accused of. I totally get it. I do. I understand what the Eagles are scared of. I understand what the Eagles didn't want to get involved in. And I also understand that at at a certain point, it's okay for Chip Kelly and the Eagles to just say, we don't want him. We don't want Deshaun Jackson anymore because he just doesn't fit in. Like I mentioned with Kyle Echol previously, earlier rather, just fitting in or just not he doesn't fit in is not going to be a good enough response, not going to be a good enough answer for the Philadelphia Eagles fan base because they want certain questions answered. They want to know about certain things, certain issues. But those things will never be answered in a public fashion. They will never be answered in a form or in an ability where people will be quoted. Because it could turn into libelous issues, slander. There's a lot of law litigation that could possibly come out from something like that. So when you look at what the Eagles have done, I think it's fine. I think it's fair. If a new regime comes in, gives everybody a chance one season, you make it or you don't. You're in or you're out. And in the case for Deshaun Jackson, he obviously was out. He was on the out and out. Before we go to a commercial break, there's a new NFL rule that's going to be put into play uh, in this coming season. No dunking the football. Remember when somebody catches the uh, catches a touchdown? Especially like Jimmy Graham, the tight end for the this, for this, uh, New Orleans Saints. He catches a touchdown, jumps up, dunks the football in between the goalposts as his touchdown celebration. Now it's a 15-yard penalty if you do that going forward. Now we all know what happened with Jimmy Graham. He did it once. He held on to the, uh, to the crossbar and that you know, pulled the goalposts uh, a little bit a, 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 a askew and caused a delay in a football game. But come on, that was one time. It's only one player who ever did that. Everybody else just jumps up and either tries to or dunks it through. Does it really turn the NFL? Does Roger Goodell really have to turn the NFL into the no-fun league? Come on. Really? Come on, guys. How often can you catch? Do you, if I caught a touchdown, I, I would do. I don't know what I would do because you're talking about guys who are huge behemoths of man. Your computer is blowing up, blowing up to the sounds of all noise radio, powered radio. by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. Welcome back. Sports Talk with the Sports Rabbi here on All Noise Radio, powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. As always, 856-330-4749, or send me a tweet at the Yussi G on Twitter. That's T-H-E-Y-O-S-S-I-G. And, of course, you could always send me a message on Facebook, facebook.com, and search for Sports Talk with the Sports Rabbi. Uh, I got here on, fa- on Facebook, I got Yogi writes a uh, healthy RG3. There's no ACL injury. Uh, the New York Giants trying to do what they always do. Dallas is on the downward swing. Philadelphia is going to win the division, but Washington is going to get a wild card. What are your thoughts, Sports Rabbi? So, Yogi, I totally agree. Uh, the Redskins significantly improve after a 3-13 and season last year, but the, the Eagles are still going to win the division even without Sean, uh, Deshaun Jackson. Uh, the marriage between the Eagles and Deshaun, of course, was always was gonna, was doomed for failure the moment Chip Kelly arrived. Uh, Jackson's link to gang members, you know, involved in that homicide, uh, was probably the final straw in a history that involved uh, mis meetings, poor work ethic, uh, poor work ethic, and of course uh, that overall bad attitude that D- that Deshaun Jackson usually had, uh, usually displayed. Uh, the Eagles were unable to cure this, the, you know, this whole problem with Deshaun uh, because they felt, and they also felt, that Deshaun maybe would infect some of the younger players with the same problems that he displays um, down the road. So they decided to nip it in the bud and, and cut him. Just that's it. We we don't want anything to do with him anymore. Remember, Deshaun only had. 28 receptions, 483 yards, and two touchdowns in eight games against 500-plus teams last year. He has not always p- 
played up to the opposing talent. He's mentally checked himself out of games from time to time. So far this offseason, the Eagles re-signed two wide receivers. They solidified, to a degree, their defense, and they added a versatile weapon in, Darryl's, in Darren Sproles. What they have next to do now is plug holes in the left field that Jackson leaves because he's now in Washington. They'll try to do that through the draft with a big body receiver who can catch red zone passes. The, red, the Eagles in the red zone last year only scored 53% of the time that they scored touchdowns. Uh, it, it's a hole that is left in the locker room by Jackson, yes, because he's been on the team since he was drafted by them, but that hole has probably begun to heal itself already. Now, moving on, baseball, right? It's the opening week. I mean, everybody's excited. Everyone's happy, thrilled. It's amazing. Everybody starts 0-0. Zero zero. I mean, the Kansas City Royals, the Baltimore Royals, the Red Sox, the Dodgers, they all started the same. Well, actually, maybe not the Dodgers because they started 2-0 and before everybody else got a chance because they won their first two games in Australia. But even so, even so, there's five questions that I think everybody needs to ask themselves if they're a, a, a fan of any team in the AL East. And these five questions are really as follows. What was going to stop Boston? What's going to stop the Red Sox from repeating? As, uh, either as pennant winners or as even as World Series champions. So, of course, you can really look at everything and say, you know, in a joking matter, well, it'll just be bad luck in the playoffs. But and I think it's more than that. Remember, John Lester, he's a different pitcher come regular season versus postseason. And if he doesn't turn it on in the postseason, you know, maybe he starts facing batters that also decide to grow their beards before the season started. Tampa Bay maybe having an MVP and the Cy Young winner. John Lackey deciding to uh, revert to 2011 form. There's not a lot to discount with the Red Sox. Because they have a very good team overall. I think that uh, they'll be fine this season. And uh, we'll get to my predictions in, in a couple minutes. Again, you want to chop hop in on the on the conversation. You want to try to get in your predictions. Uh, 856-330-4749. Or send me a message on Facebook. Facebook.com. Search for Sports Talk with the Sports Rabbi. Or you can also send me a message on Twitter. At the SCG. T-H-E-Y-O-S-S-I-G. Second question that I have is really, this is really the big question, is can the New York Yankees get through this season winning with the current infield and the bullpen that it has? Because remember, even though Brian Cashman pulled a lot of voodoo this offseason, pulled a lot of voodoo magic, he's in a contractual year himself, and this contractual year may not pan out so well for him. He's expecting, he's banking on 90 wins, and I don't know if that's really going to happen because when you look at the team, they got big holes in the second base, big holes at third base. They got an aging Mark Teixeira. Derek Jeter's retiring after this year. The outfield, yes, it's strong with Brett Gardner and Jacoby Ellsbury, but can Carlos Beltran really stay healthy all year? Now, I know Beltran's been a productive he uh, hitter the last couple seasons, but asking him, to stay healthy for a whole season is really, like, you're, you're asking a lot from that guy. He's 36 years old. He's had some injury problems in the past. That's a big question mark there in right field. Now, when you look at the bullpen and you look at what the pitching staff offers for the Yankees, now, closer David Robinson is probably going to be solid. I mean, don't forget, he's not Mariano Rivera. Uh, uh, Marianos don't come around every year. So Yankees fans are going to have to realize that and understand that and deal with that from very early on, that David Robertson is no enter Sandman. Sean, Ken Sean Kelly has got a very good command of the ball in terms of strikeouts. I mean, his strikeout rate is incredible, but he's very vulnerable to giving up the home runs. Matt Thornton is not um, the Matt Thornton of old. He's not what he used to be. David Phelps is okay as a middle reliever, but you really you're, you're asking for much. You're asking for a lot. I mean, Betancourt, I mean, he's a rookie. He's unproven, really untested. I think the key for the Yankees bullpen is in terms of how much it's going to be used, because 
if it's overused, then forget it. You mean you're, you 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 got major issues, major disasters waiting to happen. And in order for the bullpen not to be overused, the starters must rebound from the disastrous season that was 2013. Baltimore, the Orioles, does it have enough pitching staff? Now, when you look at what the Orioles did in the offseason, they added Obaldo Jimenez to the team to fill out a rotation of Chris Tillman, Miguel Gonzalez, Wei-Yin Chen, and Bud Norris. And, of course, you have Kevin Gosman, who's waiting in in the bullpen in case something happens to any of the aforementioned pitchers. Now, this pitching staff does not really scare anybody. It's not as flashy as what the Yankees have or as Boston. But the Orioles have proven year in, over the last couple of years, with the stewardship, the leadership of Buck Showalter, that games are played elsewhere, not only on the, not only on the mound. They're also played elsewhere on the diamond. Now in Tampa, the big question is, does it really matter who closes? Tampa's bullpen has a ridiculous, copious amounts of talent. Grant Belfour, Heath Bell, Joel Peralta, Jake McGee, just to name a couple. Now, they're all capable setup men, and they are all, are to a degree, experienced clo- closers. Anyone can get the job. Anyone can get it done after the fifth inning. The Rays' starting pitching is solid enough that the bullpen shouldn't be overused this season, and it should be ready to go come playoff time. Will R.A. Dickey return to Cy Young form? I think this really has been... You know, it's not really such a surprise when you consider what the Rogers Center is like. It's not really a pitcher's ballpark, especially somebody who has that knuckleball delivery that Dickey has. Well, so far, give Dickey credit. He's produced an extra two to three miles per hour on his knuckleball, and he's going to need that the entire season if he wants to thrive at the Rogers Center in Toronto. Because behind him, other than Mark Burley, the Blue Jays really are lacking in quality arms. There really isn't enough to go around with them. My, predi- my prediction is, uh, is Boston wins the division. Tampa and the Yankees are the wild cards because most of the other teams in the AL are just more flawed than Tampa and the Yankees. And then Baltimore and then Toronto finishing last in the division. Well, tune in next week for an amazing show. It's going to be a lot of fun. I have a lot of more things to talk about, a lot of things I did not get into on this show, as well as, of course, we have some really cool guests coming on. Uh, don't forget to always, you know, if you're in a pinch, you're in a hurry, don't forget to always just tune in to me uh, also on Israel Sports Radio. On, uh, and as always, if you need a wing and you need a prayer, you know where to go. Powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting, simulcasted as the UCG Show on Israel Sports Radio. Dot com. Until next time, stay thirsty, stay awesome, and always enjoy the adventure. All noise radio. The noise. The noise. You can't ignore. Honey, again you're sitting here sulking? I hate my job, and I don't know what to do to change it. Get off the couch and go check out the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. The Connecticut School of Broadcasting? What's that? <laughs> The Connecticut School of Broadcasting offers a career and lifestyle change through a broadcasting experience you won't ever forget. Log on to GoCSB.com to find out how a career in broadcasting is for you and not just the people you see on TV or hear on the radio. CSB focuses on many aspects of real-world broadcasting and their knowledgeable instructors teach you through a hands-on approach so you're in the studio in no time. To find out how CSB can help you work in an industry you love, call 1-800-TV-RADIO or check us out online at Go. CSB.com. Why work 50 weeks a year for a two-week vacation when you can enjoy your job every day? Don't just sit there. Call 1-800-TV-RADIO or log on to GoCSB.com. Thanks, Thanks CSB. CSB. Your computer is blowing up. blowing up to the sounds of all-noise radio. Powered radio. by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting.